Uh, David Fitzgerald has been called the Ferris Bueller of San Francisco. Uh, he is also, oh, uh, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, he is, among other things, the Secular Student Alliance RCO, Regional Campus organizer. Campus organizer for California and Nevada, Action Coordinator for San Francisco Atheists, co-founder of the world's first atheist film festival, and with Greta Christina and Chris Hall, the Godless Pervert Story Hour and the Godless Pervert Social Club. He is also a historical researcher and the author of Nailed and the Complete Heretic's Guide to Western Religion. Uh, he also writes sexy, heretic-friendly erotica under the name Kilt Kilt Patrick, Damn Is He Sexy, David Fitzgerald. Woohoo! Thank you, Greta. Is this lavalier mic picking me up? Can you hear me way in the cheap seats up there? All right. This is a story that is from the book Under the Kilt, which may still be available for purchase in the merchandise table if it hasn't been hunted to extinction. Um, this particular story is called Later Days Saints, and it's the story of a young Berkeley co-ed, Sabrina, who one day is visited at her place in Berkeley by two Mormon missionaries, and Satan makes it seem right in her eyes to seduce them. <laughs> I'll just read a little bits and pieces of it to get the sexy going. It starts like this. I know, I know, this is the part where I go straight to hell, but honestly, can you blame me? Are you trying to tell me you would have done the same thing in my place? Bitch, you're such a liar. Skip a little bit. She meets these two hunky Mormon missionaries and then tells her friend, so they do the whole, hi, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and we're in your neighborhood today to share with you the blah, blah, blah spiel. And I say, hey, I'm Sabrina, and I'm all, wow, that's great, come on in, like I'd never heard of such an amazing undertaking before. Really? Another testament of Jesus Christ? Well, the whole time I'm already concocting my evil plan to jump their bones. I've never attempted such a crazy combo maneuver, the high-level religious depancing and the simultaneous double seduction. It's unheard of, never been done. I feel like an Olympic athlete. I focus accordingly. First hurdle, I'm still holding the straight guy, girl's guide to sleeping with chicks, real book incidentally, in my hands. Uh, gotta lose that, so I use my ninja skills to stash it under a throw pillow fast, like a reverse pickpocket. Score, it's a good thing I'm just back from class with a professor I want to impress because I'm not dressed in anything too riot girl or hippie chick, and I'm not loafing around in my uber comfy Cal Berkeley sweatshirt nighty and grizzly bear slippers. In fact, I'm totally rocking the smart, studious co-ed look. My hair's in its ponytail, and I'm wearing my naughty librarian glasses and a super cute pink short sleeve button-up blouse that hides the Celtic triple spiral tattoo on my shoulder. I'm in the jeans that make my legs look long and my butt irresistible without being slutty about it. I'm not even wearing my lucky thong, just unpretentious fuchsia panties from JCPenney's. I snap open the top button on my blouse on the sly and turn down Katy Perry before she starts in about kissing a girl and liking it. The whole time, I'm quickly scanning the room for anything else potentially incriminating. Luckily, I straightened up recently. Wow, timing really is everything. So there's no sex toys, porn, or uppity feminist slash godless slash science reading material in sight. The only potential giveaway of my dangerous inner nature is a small poster of Eleanor Roosevelt with her and my motto, do one thing every day that scares you. Can do, Eleanor, baby. <laughs> okay, so now I'm thinking where to hold our uplifting little chat. The bedroom's right out. The couch is tempting, but too forward. So the wobbly little table in the dining room it is. Dreamy elder steward takes the lead, wait, walking me through the intros of his little blue book of Mormon. I nod and make polite interest noises while he tells me how in 1830 something upstate New York, the prophet Joseph Smith, who I swear looks just like a young James Spader in a cravat, gets the scoop from the angel Moroni that all other religions are bullshit. I'm paraphrasing. And really displeasing to the Lord. Tell me why angels of the Lord always appear to prophets in remote, secluded locales instead of God just telling everybody? Or why a God would wait until the friggin' 1830s to get it right? But whatever. Bite your tongue and stick to the plan already, Sabrina. So the boys take turns telling me how Joseph Smith translated golden plates using the magic Uma Thurman stones or something. It all sounded very Harry Potter, to be honest. I'm plotting while they go on about Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, celestial, terrestrial, and telestial heavens. The three witnesses who vouched for all this, and eight other witnesses who vouched for them, and that if we prayerfully sought answers from our Heavenly Father, He would give us a burning in our bosom so that we might know the truth. Trademark. My eyes are glazing over a little, so I review my options. I've never been one for the in-your-face wanton sex goddess approach. Screw this made-up bullshit, boys, let's fuck! And I'm pretty sure they'd bolt in terror if I tried. I'm not nearly glam enough to pull off the... Femme fatale, simply staring them into drooling lustful submission, Marlena Dietrich style. 
So I'm half listening to their talk of lost Israelite tribes escaping the Tower of Babel, sailing to the New World, and because of their sin, turning into American Indians. I know, right? But really, I'm in my default nice girl seduction mode, leaning in close, feigning rapt interest, laughing at anything remotely resembling a joke, and taking an opportunity for innocent, accidental bumping of elbows and touching hands. But damn my inner anthropology major. Even while my panties were growling, were calling the shots, even while my panties were calling the shots, my spoil sport brain still couldn't keep from butting in with stupid questions and nearly queering the whole deal. Though, in my defense, there was a lot of snickering to suppress. All the pictures of the Nephites and the Lamanites were pretty gay. The models all looked like Conan the Barbarian, and ancient America looked like a Dungeons and Dragons convention. So I decided to drop the innocent seeker approach and shift to a different strategy the saucy, challenging opponent. Wait, it really says these guys had steel swords and silk togas and chariots and elephants in America over 2,000 years ago? And that millions of them were killed in, in upstate New York? I'm genuinely puzzled. Oh, yes, they nod. My appalled inner archaeologist comes out swinging. But has anybody ever found any of these battlefield sites or steel artifacts or elephant bones? And you realize there are no horses to pull their chariots or silkworms outside of China in 600 BC, right? They squirm a little and promise to locate a good book on Mormon archaeology for me that will clear up the matter. Believe me, this back and forth goes on for fucking ever, and every two minutes I'm sure I've overplayed my hand and they're going to storm out all offended any second now, but they stick it out. Oh, so finally I say, hey, if Joseph Smith translated it, why is it in King James English? They smile kind of nervously and say something about it being a very accurate translation from Reformed Egyptian, whatever the hell that is, but by now I think even they are feeling a little shaky about their answers. And honestly, I tried not to be too harsh, but hey, after all, they were the ones who came knocking on my door, right? I swear I wasn't a total biatch about it, though. I don't even bring up polygamy even once. Seems like a cheap shot. And I'm completely set to gri cheerfully grit my teeth through any talk of how many babies good Mormon women are expected to pop out. And all my good-natured sparring aside, I've got my diplomacy hat on. I keep things super friendly and take careful track of any encouraging signs. And signs are good. Both guys seem to like the closeness when we accidentally bump up against each other by accident. I'm very scrupulous to accidentally touch both of them very equally. And I totally love that both are being so careful not to be caught staring down my top, even though their eyes keep being drawn to my forbidden goodies within. Excellent. When I accidentally contemplate out loud that it would be easy enough to check if American Indians and Jews were related with DNA evidence, they turn a little pale, and that's when I think, Okay, cool it, Brainiac. Time to switch from bad cop to good cop, pronto. Uh, hey, can I get you guys something to drink? Oh, just water's fine, thank you. Coming right up. I adjust my jeans ever so tightly as I head off to the kitchen just to give them something to think about. So get this, I pop out again with two glasses of orange juice and then I stop and make a dough face. Oh shoot, you guys said water, didn't you? What was I thinking? Are you guys even allowed to drink Sunny D? Oh, sure they assured me. Cause I can take these back if, oh no, that's fine. Everybody drinks juice, right? Okay then. I roll my eyes and stick my tongue out a little, shake my head. Oh, what a silly goof I am. We all have a good laugh and they drink up. Mmm, good. Let me skip a little bit further down. We talk some more, mostly about small stuff, nothing churchy or deep. They just want to know how I liked UC Berkeley and what I was studying, what I like to do, stuff like that. That's really nice. But the whole time I'm getting so fucking horny that I'm sure they can hear my pussy growling. And I start visualizing the next phase of Operation Double Horn Dog. I flirt with a damsel in distress tactic. I'd fake a massive Charlie horse, groin pulsey, and then they'd have to carry me over to the couch. I'd lie down and have them elevate my leg. Here, Aiden, could you stand over there and massage my thigh? It really hurts. Yeah, just cradle my leg in your crotch, just like that, yes. And Cameron, can you lean over and rub my neck and shoulders? No, wait, I guess it's really my ribs and pecs that hurt. Just lean over and yes, that's it. Oh, Aiden, I don't mean for my foot to be kneading your privates like that. It's just an involuntary muscle relax. Cameron, your tie's in my face. Here, let me get that for you. We're still chatting, and I just about have this whole damsel thing mapped out and wonder if I can really pull it off when suddenly I have this ultra mind boggling triple epiphany. It starts when they said something about having to go visit so many houses in a day, and I start to make up some total bullshit like, oh, I wouldn't go bother worrying about the rest of the neighborhood. They're all Baptists and Hare Krishnas. No need to waste your time hunting there. And then whammo, I realize, hey, these guys have been here for over two hours already. They've totally blown their day's schedule. And then it hits me, wait a sec, they've got to have strict rules against male missionaries visiting unmarried young girls unchaperoned or something. I realize these guys have already told breaking their rules. 
And once I realize all that, I get this incredible, bright, shining, beautiful burst of transcendent certainty. I can totally do this. These two gorgeous men children want to be seduced. I know it with a deep, divine burning in my bosom. I am so going to nail both of these Mormon boys. But, I have to, but you know, I, have, I gotta say, for all my plotting and conniving, it was humbly, downright and miraculous, really, how simple it was. At this perfect pause in the conversation, I just suddenly zen like, no, it's time. I stand up, pull my glasses off and my scrunchie out, letting my hair grow wild and free. Voila, schoolgirl the sex goddess, just like that. I give them a look and a smile and reach over and take them by both their neckties. Come on, I say, leading my captives back toward the couch. And amazingly, they do. Should I keep going? <laughs> I sink into the couch and pull them down after me. For a second, they just look at me, all nervous and excited, not quite sure what to do next. I keep a firm grip on their neckties and look from one to the other. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. I finish on Cameron and draw him in for a long, big, wet kiss. It's everything I'd hope for from that luscious mouth. Then I turn to Aiden and reel him in for his chance. Oh yes, two for two. Mmm, happy Sabrina. I lounge between them like this, taking turns, pulling them in for deep, yummy tongue kisses back and forth. I'm so impressed with how well the boys share. They stroke my legs and arms while they wait their turn. It feels so good. I think I'd just be dandy if this could go on for just a few more hours. But then they start nuzzling my neck from both sides, and that feels so amazing, I totally lose it. Lose my grip on their ties. I give them both a little free range and wrap my arms around them. I grab big handfuls of their hair and they each start rubbing a breast. I enjoy that for a minute and then I go up and work my way out from under and tell them to let me stand up for a sec. I was going to give them a strip tease, but I feel a little dizzy and decide it'll be more fun to have them do the work anyway. I have them unbutton my blouse. I make Aiden start at the top and Cameron at the bottom. And then I do the honors of unhooking my bra. The look on their faces is priceless. I lower myself toward them and wind up sitting on my knees on the couch and hanging onto it so they can each get at my boobs. Damn, I feel just like a mother goddess with the two of them each having a mouthful of me. I know I had to stay in charge and not give any puritanical mormon -y impulses a chance to raise their ugly heads. I push them off for a sec, unsnap the fly and slither out of my jeans as sexy as I can manage. My panties are soaked but it feels exhilarating as hell to stand there for a moment with my thumbs tucked in them and my hips cocked while they sit there all dazed in their geek squad shirts and ties. Looking up at me worshipfully, I peel off my panties and kick them away, then giving my, uh, give my adoring congregation a little twirl to show off my ass. Since I started with Cam last time, it seems only fair to give Aiden first crack this round. I flop down on the couch and order him to get on his knees in front of me. Then I reach down between my legs to grab his, his tie like a dog leash. This is a fun game. And pull him face first into my wet little love trap. Go on, get busy, I growl. Then I look over at Cameron and say, come here, pretty boy. I snatch his tie, too, and pull him down for some more frenching. I have to break it off after a little bit to give Aiden some, a few pointers. It really was his first time going down on a girl. He has good instincts, though, and picked it right up. God, yes! I shudder up my first orgasm right there. It's been a long time coming, but fuck me, so worth the wait. It's unreal having Cam snog me and caress the girls while Aiden is partying up downtown. I keep my right hand buried in Aiden's hair and reach over to the front of Cam's slacks with the left. I run my palm down the stiff bulge there, mmm, nice, and then slip it down, through, and hook around to totally cop a feel of that sweet little butt of his. Another minute of that, and then I make him switch places. Tough, but fair. Cam doesn't disappoint on his oral exam either, and I'm all over Aiden's junk like it was a braille book. It feels high time to raise the nudity quotient in the house, so I take my tongue out of Aiden's mouth and bring Cam up for air. I get them in close so I can let them in on a little secret. Listen up. I put vodka in your orange drink. Can you feel all that alcohol working in your bloodstream, making you drunk and restless? Reckless? You're in trouble now, aren't you? You've totally fallen into my sinful trap. Their eyes get wider, but it looks like everything thus far has overwhelmed the verbal half of their brains, or male brains, as well as their moral centers. I snake my hands down to crest their cocks to their trousers. And tonight, you're going to do what I tell you, aren't you? They shoot anxious looks at each other. Don't look at him. Look at me. I want to hear you say it. First Cameron, then Aiden croak out, yes. Yes, what, I glare. We're going to do what you say. God, they even stammer in unison. I'll leave that for now. That was from Under the Kilt. Stories called Later Days Saints.